Welcome back to a special edition of the Friday show presented by Woodbine Racetrack. I'm Ray Pollock with Natalie Voss, the editor-in-chief of the Pollock Report, joined by Hall of Fame jockey Chris McCarron. Chris, thanks for joining with being with us. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to yeah. see you guys. Well, the reason uh, Natalie and I discussed this earlier in the week, and we thought it would be great to get the perspective of, of a Hall of Fame jockey to talk about uh, – a really uh, an important issue, and that's use of the riding crop, the whip. And the reason that, that it came to light was an incident that happened earlier this week at uh, Parks at uh, in Philadelphia, where a jockey struck a horse, not in the race, but after the race. The stewards are meeting with him. Uh, I'm assuming they're going to hand out some sort of sanction. We really don't know what it is yet as we tape this. But uh, let, let's first of all take a look at the incident itself. So, Chris, when you when you see something like that, what, what's your immediate thought? Uh, my immediate thought is to put that rider's name on the board right away. What that means is in the jocks room, there's a chalkboard that, uh, with stewards list uh, as the title of that chalkboard. And uh, if your name goes on that, that means you have an appointment to see the stewards the following morning or the following race day morning. Uh, and then you meet with them and determine exactly what happened, how it happened, why it happened. Uh, could you know? Could some patience uh, been been uh, added to that mix where the rider didn't lose his cool? Uh, it's hard to it's hard to say. Looking at it, was he was he mad at his horse? Is he was he was he very disappointed that he got that he got beat uh, and, and taking out his frustration on the horse? Uh, uh, unless, you know, we're privy to the interview with the stewards, we're, we're just not going to know those things. Yeah. You were known during your career as a pretty uh, aggressive rider with, with, the, with the whip, weren't you? I was, yeah, and I'm not proud of that at all. Um, I, I'm glad that uh, my, uh, later on in my career, it took me quite a long time to, to learn how to, you know, employ the hand ride as opposed to using the stick all the time and uh you know i was very successful right off the bat as you know and um you know won over 500 races my first year and almost 500 my second year and um it's still uh, the the learning curve being a, a race rider is is rather challenging and uh, there's so much to learn that I, I was still learning when I retired after 28 years in the saddle. And I learned even more when I started teaching, when I had to articulate what my thoughts were to the students and try to instill in them what's, you know, what, what the experience is like. And uh, so that the learning process of being a jockey is, is, is quite slow. It, it is for, for, it was for me anyway. Uh, despite the fact that I was success right off the bat, um, there were so many intricate things that you can learn uh, about, you know, what makes a horse tick and, you know, how, what's the best way to uh, get cooperation from your mouth. That's the number one thing that we're trying to achieve is cooperation, whether that's to go really, really fast or to rate kindly or whatever the, the case may be. Uh, we're trying to get cooperation from the horse and, uh, a lot of riders think that, you know, the best way to do that is by using the stick. How are things different? How are things different today than than when they were when when you first started riding? Perception, uh, the public's attitude toward racing and and the whip. Well, I think the I think the average uh, race goer is becoming much more sen sensitive to the topic of r hitting a horse with a stick. And, um, you know, that perception turns into reality after, after a while. And so, um, I'm hoping that these new changes, these new rules that are going to be put in place in different States, different jurisdictions will, will be a bit of a wake up call and, and have the riders start thinking now about, 
being limited with the number of strikes that you can that you can hit a horse. Natalie, Natalie spent some time out at the riding school at the Kentucky Horse Park uh, observing, and and she's a horsewoman rider herself. I'm sure you've got some questions, Natalie. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I have picked up on as I've listened to um, people debating rule changes for the whip or the crop, depending on um, how you want to call it, uh, there seems to be kind of a thought um, from current jockeys that uh, if we just sort of educate the public about the use of the crop, then they'll understand what we're doing. They won't be as concerned about that. It seems to me like maybe the window for that may have passed, but I'd be curious to get your thoughts on, is it possible to explain whip use to the public in a way that might make them more tolerant of seeing it, do you think? Uh, no, I, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's a viable possibility, Natalie. Uh, I, I think you're right. I think the horse is out of the barn on that one. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I do wonder sometimes when we see an incident like this one at parks or, or when you just sort of notice a rider who seems to have a greater propensity for just a lot of whip use in a short amount of distance or, or maybe misusing the whip like he did here. What do you find is kind of behind that psychology when you're teaching a student, Chris? Is it like, is it a a lack of understanding of the impact on the horse? Is it just getting caught up in the moment and not really thinking things through? Like how do people kind of end up doing these things? Um, well, there's a number of different, any number of different reasons why a rider might, um, you know, exert uh, some physical force with, with the stick. Um, uh, a lot of, a lot of riders that, that I, I've been watching the races very closely, especially up at Saratoga. And, um, you know, it's nice to see that there are some of the riders are, are star already starting to be very conscious about, you know, how they're going to employ the stick, uh, how often and how hard and, and where in the race and where on the horse's body. That's another, that's one of the bones I, I have to pick is not necessarily how many times they're hitting a horse, but where, where they hit a horse too. And, and uh, going back to my history, I was guilty of, of uh, hitting a horse a little short, hit him, hit him in the flank. I didn't do it on purpose. I did it in the heat of competition, but that's no excuse, really. Uh, you know, I, I became much wiser as, as I went on, and, and uh, I thought a whole lot more about um, how much I would, I would use the stick. And um, I, I think there are more riders that are coming around to this way of thinking. There's 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 been reforms in in several states. Uh, some states haven't changed anything, but one of the problems that I see, and it, this is a problem for for riders that travel. Of course, nobody's traveling right now, but when you're in one state, they've got one rule. You go across the the border to the next state, they've got a different rule. Um, they're kind of, they seem to be constantly changing and being assessed. Chris, do you have a particular? reform that you would like to see go nationwide and not, not that that's possible because of the, the structure of racing it's hard to get anything done nationwide but is there one you know one piece of reform whether it's taking the whip in, entirely away from the riders or, or so, something along those lines that you would like to see well i'm definitely not in favor of taking it away altogether it, it is it is a tool that i found very useful uh for for safety reasons uh, a number of times uh, throughout my career, if I didn't have a stick, I, I would have been on the ground. Um, you know, it, it does, it does use, it does, um, it is good for a corrective measure every once in a while. Um, but, um, I think that the, uh, making the judgment on what is a corrective measure and what is, uh, abuse, um, I think the riders have to be much more cognizant of the eyes that are upon them. They're living in a fishbowl right now. And um, what reforms I would I would take it even a step further, not just nationally, but internationally. I'd love to see an international set of rules, whether it's six strikes, whether it's you can't raise your hand above your shoulder uh, or you can't cock the stick. You have to hit a, the horse with the with the stick uh, backhand. Um, I, I'm open to any of those suggestions, just as long as there's some uniformity. Uh, that would be that would be wonderful. 
you know, uniformity. That's been something that they've been, they've been trying for 50 years or more in, right. in medication. Um, yeah. Yeah. Natalie, what do you... Uh, uh, I was just sort of wondering, Chris, how do you sort of instruct or when you were at the jockey school um, or the North American Racing Academy, um, how did you instruct jockeys and exercise riders about the the best and the safest ways to use the stick for correction? Because I, I think it is very important that that be an option for jockeys who naturally are riding with their their legs up under up under them they don't have their legs in their seat to help guide a horse that might be spooking so how do you sort of walk them through the process of what's going to um, be an appropriate use that will help the horse correct course rather than you know possibly make a situation worse well uh, ironically um and i don't know if this is good bad or indifferent but uh, teaching them how to use the stick was something that comes very late in the, in the two year course that I, that I taught. Um, I, I taught them how to use their hands most efficiently, uh, most effectively, uh, as opposed to using a stick to, uh, to correct any, any measure. Um, I, I think that you need to be, uh, you need to have experience and you need to be an expert with the stick. And so, we would uh, do a lot of exercises on the equisizer that we, the, uh, we had seven different equisizers when we were teaching. And um, I would uh, teach the students on, on the equisizer first of how to use the stick as opposed to doing it when they're up on the horse's back. That makes sense. I imagine they, uh, did the horses figure out at some point, oh, we're in the part of the semester where they haven't had the stick yet. So I can you know, maybe not put all my effort into this gallop. <laughs> well, uh, that that suited me just fine. If, if a horse went around there cantering and just galloping nice and easy without getting into the bridle, uh, that, that, was a, that was a happy morning for me. But most of the time, the horses pulled pretty hard, so they didn't even need a stick to go out there uh, see, I didn't really train my horses all that hard. So they were, they were fit thoroughbreds and they were fresh all the time. So, uh, I had to, uh, I had to hope and pray that, um, you know, they'd be able to get them around there quietly and, and not have to worry about, it. they certainly didn't need a stick to go forward. <laughs> I wanted to ask Chris of, of, of the many great horses that you've ridden, were there some that, that, that maybe if you know if if you were restricted in the use of the crop that maybe wouldn't have been as good there were certain horses that really responded to use of the whip and 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 maybe wouldn't have won races if you weren't so aggressive i never touched sunday silence with the stick hmm. charlie told me in the paddock do not hit this cold he doesn't like to be hit every time patrick hits him he ducks and i went back and looked at every one of his races and sure enough uh, the Colt, when he made the lead and started to open up a little bit and got hit with the stick, he ducked to the left, he ducked to the right. Um, so uh, Charlie was adamant in the paddock saying, this Colt really doesn't like to be hit. I don't want you to hit him unless it's unless you feel it's absolutely necessary. And uh, sure, we were lucky the wire was coming up. Easy Gar was, was flying on the outside at Gulfstream Park. But, um, you know, Sunday Silence was a, was a good enough horse that, when he made the lead, he kind of waited a little bit. He was, he was waiting to see if I was going to hit him or not. And all I did was shake the stick at him left-handed. And the second time, the first time I went on Tiz now, uh, I think I hit him four times. I hit him once right-handed and then tapped him three times left-handed. And he was able to, uh, you know, show enough gameness and hold off Giants Causeway. And then uh, the next year, I only hit him once. I told Jay in the paddock, Jay Robbins, his trainer, that uh, in the heat of battle, I'm, I don't get upset if you don't see me hitting this colt because I'm not. He doesn't want to be hit. I'm not. I'm not going to hit him. And um, Saki came to me, went by me by about a neck. And at the 16th pole, I thought, well, you know, it it, it felt it really felt like I was going to finish second because Saki had the momentum at that point. Mm -hmm. But I reached back and I tapped his now one time left-handed, and he gave me a burst of speed that was like ridiculous i i was uh i didn't realize he was waiting that much on the lead when when uh, saki got to me but i actually felt him re-break and uh he went on and showed a tremendous amount of courage to come back on and as tom said tis now wins it for america 
and that's a race that you feel like if you hadn't used the stick, he probably might not have gone on to win it then. I think if I went to whaling on him, if I turned home and I hit him right-handed three or four times and hit him left-handed, uh, I think he would have sulked. And I think a lot of horses sulk, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the, so what's the, when you see jockeys switch from right to left hand, is there a reason for that? Sure. To shake the horse up, you know, to, to, to wake him up to, um, to, I hate to say this, but they build up a little tolerance. You have to hit them two or three times on one side, they're building up a little tolerance there. And so you, you, you switch to hit them on the other side and, uh, you know, it's, it's to, it's to wake them up, to shake them up and hopefully find a, find another gear. So you're clearly an advocate that if you take away that piece of equipment from the jockeys, the, the game is going to change. It'll put a lot more pressure on the riders, I think, because mm -hmm. to do nothing but a, a pure, solid hand ride is very taxing physically. It's very, very tiring. And uh, believe it or not, it takes it takes less effort to to ride a horse using a stick than it does to not use the stick. Mm -hmm. That's hard to believe, but that's, that's the way I felt when I was riding. Just, I was curious. I know that there are, um, you know, riders who say that there's horses who, or who are not going to put in any effort unless the, the stick is presented to them. But it sounds like from what you're telling us, there's also horses that sulk and don't put in any effort when they are hit. So I was just sort of curious, is there so much individual variability? Do you think that we'd be kind of, running into a problem either way with some horses who are going to be inhibited by not having a whip and some who were inhibited by having one used on them as it is. I, I think if I were to try to put it in a percentage uh, formula, I would say there's a higher percentage of horses that respond favorably from being struck with the whip than do horses that sulk. Uh, when I mentioned there are horses that sulk, yes, there are, but percentage wise, it's, it's a much greater percentage of horses that go forward when, and, and perform favorably. Um, but, uh, I, I, I think that, um, I think it's going to be an adjustment for the riders, but I think there's a lot of really smart race riders out there and they're going to be able to, uh, make the adjustments over time. They may not do it overnight, but it'll, it's just a matter of time before um, they all start riding more like uh, Joel Rosario and, and Javier Castellano. Uh, but I'm very impressed with those two young guys, uh, the way they uh, hand ride a horse down through the stretch. It's, uh, it's, it's quite fun to see. It's, it's fun to watch. Chris, before I let you go, you rode with some of the, the all-time greats. Um, who, who, who was a peer if you looked over, you know, looked next to you and said, Oh no, it's him. Uh, who did you fear the most that that was the best finisher in a race? Uh, you you can't uh, you can't separate Shoe and, and Lafitte. Um, you know, Bill Shoemaker. He he always had more horse than it looked like he had. He always looked like he's riding his horse, but he was just riding them along very comfortably. And uh, he was a he just an outstanding finisher as well. And then Lafitte. Uh, they had different styles. Uh, Shu uh, looked like always looked like he was finishing with a horse, uh, whereas Lafitte is finishing on a horse. Uh, Lafitte is on that horse's back, and he's shoving and pushing and pulling and doing everything he possibly can to uh, to lift that horse across the wire. And uh, you know, both those guys are my idols, and I I can't separate them. Well, I'm sure when they looked over and saw you, they felt the same way that uh, Chris McCarron is going to be tough to beat in this race. Chris, you're in the Hall of Fame for a reason. Uh, you continue to be an advocate for the game. Appreciate that. And we appreciate your time today. And we will see you next week on the Friday show. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me.